our esteemed speaker professor lawrence hall distinguished university professor and co director institute of ai and x department of computer science and engineering university of south florida tampa usa professor hall is also itpl vice president for publications products and services for 2021 before we start the actual lecture program i would request itpl kolkata section chair professor susmita mitro to give the welcome address and to formally introduce professor hall uh, uh, a very good evening to to all in india and a very good morning to you larry so uh, i welcome you here on behalf of the kolkata section to our uh, online event so this year we are all constrained by the pandemic and it has given us a very good opportunity to interact with people like you and uh, and uh, it is also feasible economically feasible to have such wonderful talks uh, in a such uh, in such a broad manner so uh, so with that uh, let me uh, in introduce professor hall uh, we uh, he is a good friend and collaborator of mine i've known he, him for several years so um, uh, i had visited him and before that he had come here to isi so uh, and and he's been a very good friend so let me uh, continue on the introduction that autonu provided so um, he received his phd in computer science from the florida state university in 1986 and a bs in applied mathematics from the florida institute of technology in 1980 he is a fellow of the ieee fellow of the aaas aimbe and iapr he received the norbert wiener award in 2012 and the joseph wold award in 2017 from the ieee smc society He is a past president of the IEEE Systems Man and Cybernetics Society, former editor in chief of what is now the IEEE Transactions on Cybernetics. He is on the editorial boards of the Proceedings of the IEEE and IEEE Spectrum. His research interests lie in learning from big data, distributed machine learning, medical image understanding, bioinformatics, pattern recognition. modeling imprecision in decision making and integrating ai into image processing he continues to explore un and unsupervised and semi supervised learning using scalable fuzzy approaches he has authored or co-authored over 100 publications in journals as well as many conference papers and book chapters he has received over dollar 6 million in research funding from agencies such as the national science foundation national institutes of health department of energy darpa and nasa so uh, with that brief introduction uh, it is my great pleasure to welcome larry to deliver his talk thank you very much sushmita i think that was i don't know if that was a brief introduction but uh, <laughs> that was brief for you <laughs> okay so let me um if everybody will uh, mute their mics it'll probably be easier for everybody to hear yeah. uh and I'll I'll yes, get going hello, here doctor. so I'm going to talk about it please uh, mute what? everybody else uh um I'll talk about, about an overview of machine and deep learning for artificial intelligence solutions um and I'm going to leave on my video uh so you can sort of see me um I'm not really sitting in a scene of trees that's artificial um but not artificial intelligence uh and what is artificial intelligence in general it's intelligence is shown by machines so it would be if we were actually interacting with some machine it seems to be uh intelligent it does good things uh that we would expect a person to do and we can say that we have ai when the machine mimics the cognitive functions that we associate with uh, other intelligent people such as it does it learns or it does problem solving uh so we ask it a question and like you can you could think of um there are mapping services 
and generally they force you to pick among the maps. But imagine if you said, you know, I want to go from, in my case, let's say I want to go from Tampa to Gainesville. What is the best route right now? And it just came back and told me, hey, there's some accidents on this road. You should go this way. And um, but you know, if you want to um, be sure to get there, then take this other route. It'll be a little bit longer because the other one can have problems. So it could tell you something like a person would do, give you uh, that kind of information. In artificial intelligence, the goal once upon a time was to pass what's called the Turing test. And um, this is named after Alan Turing. And he said, you know, in a conversation, if you cannot tell whether you're speaking with a person or a computer, then this is a true artificial intelligence. And there have been instances where people have been fooled, but it's a very focused topic. So when you're talking with a real person, you can talk about different kinds of things, and you can tell they're a real person. Even if you go to a topic they don't know anything about, you'll, you'll quickly see if, if they'll fumble or they'll say, I don't know anything about that. But a machine will sort of wander around and try to answer you. <clears throat> so. <laughs> So this is maybe a little dated in, in a sense because my examples here are from, um, you know, have things about flying and nobody's flying right now thanks to the pandemic. But I think that these are actually good in use cases of artificial intelligence and they're not called artificial intelligence anymore. <clears throat> so one of the difficult things for, for, for uh, getting flights off the ground is actually scheduling the pilots and the flight attendants and getting them in the right cities and at the right times. And that's all done by AI, but it's just called scheduling of crews. Uh, when you assign gates at an airport, so an, air, an airplane is coming in early or it's coming in late or it's coming in on time and an air uh, plane is low, late getting out because there's weather somewhere else, you have to get it to a gate. How is that done? It used to be done by people in a room working really hard on, you know, with uh, spreadsheets or just paper. Now it's done by AI, but it's just called a gate assignment. One of my least favorite things is dynamic pricing on demand. If you've ever looked at um, airline tickets changing while you're looking for flights, you'll see this. Now I bring this particular one up. A friend of mine at Carnegie Mellon actually did some uh, of the early pioneering work on this. And maybe early on it was really pretty terrible. You could drive up and and you could drive up your price of an airline ticket by simply clicking, being indecisive and clicking among several um, alternatives a few times, going back and forth and looking at them. The airline would decide, oh, there's a lot of demand, even though it was just me. At that time, it wasn't filtering who it was. So it was kind of a dumb AI, I would say. But uh, um, uh, <laughs> it, it would jam up the price. I managed to do that to myself once or twice. I don't believe that happens anymore. It will know it's just you and you're indecisive. Um, AI is in use, you know, in, in chatbots. If you've ever used a chatbot, you may or may not like it, um, but it is done by AI. If you've used Google Translate, that is done with artificial intelligence. And Google Translate has gotten pretty good now. Um, you can, you know, I've used it over the years partly because I have a cousin who's uh, French and speaks not a huge amount of English. I don't speak a huge amount of French. Um, so he'll send stuff to me in French and I'll try to translate it. And it used to come up with weird things like uh, told me his daughter had uh, bicycled across the English Channel, which is not possible, um, to Cambridge. But what was actually had happened is she was in Cambridge bicycling around, which I already knew that wasn't why I was translating it. I was trying to figure out what exactly she was studying. So I would say we're in a – artificial intelligence over time has had uh, winters and summers. Summers being where everything is really hot and winters being everything where things are not so hot. And what is powering the current AI summer? Because it's in the news, it's being used quite a bit. Uh, you're seeing things like um, uh, companies popping up that have really cool ideas and maybe they implement them, maybe they don't. But machine learning is, I think, the biggest driver. And um, machine learning has been around for a while, but we haven't had the amount of data that we do. And in machine learning, um, neural networks with many hidden layers are really driving a lot of the um, interesting work. And they're called deep neural networks because they have lots of labels and, sorry, lots of layers. And the models are built by deep learning. So deep neural networks, lots of layers, and I'll, 
talk about this a little bit more. And it's, you have deep learning, so you'll see this in the um, in the literature. But there are lots of other learning algorithms, and this needs this works. Whoops, this works best with big data, and not only big data, but big labeled data. And label, getting data labeled is a, is a problem that's beyond the scope of this talk, but it is really, you know, uh, if you want labels on data, you want good labels, so generally you need experts to label the data if it's in a specialty field. Uh, you can be sure that experts don't like to label data. Um, it's not really fun for them, and they're in demand. So there are other learning algorithms, including decision trees, naive bay, which, which force of which perform well, so a set of decision trees or an ensemble and really perform well. Naive Bayes, Bayesian approaches support vector machines and lots of others. And these work pretty good with small data. So if you don't have a lot, a lot of labeled data, you're probably going to use this. And that, this talk is really going to focus on labeled data. If you don't have labeled data, you might use fuzzy clustering. You might use other clusters. So the clustering works with unlabeled data and tries to group it based on its features. One of the big reasons that deep neural networks are popular is they discover features. They can discover features for you. So, you know, it's important to know what are the features in a domain that differentiate uh, two classes or three classes. And over time, people have developed research programs which are focused on finding the best features quickly. Um, but deep neural networks will find them for you, which is, of course, appeals to the appeals to everybody because you don't have to do as much work. All right. So this is. Um, I was told we wanted to give a little bit of instruction here. I, I figure in one talk I can't give you too much instruction, but I can tell you a little bit about decision trees, I think, that you can actually dig your teeth into um, because they're pretty simple, but they're really pretty powerful in, in interesting ways, I think. So if I think about just two classes of, of data, so, so two classes, two labels, two things that I want to differentiate and have three features or descriptors of the data. So I have, things that tell me about the data. I'm not going to give you a real world example. This can be a little bit of a theoretical example because it's hard to, with little tiny data, make any sort of real world example that has any kind of meaning at all. But to build a decision tree is really very simple in some sense. I just have to break the examples into groups somehow. Just need to break them into groups. I would like to have the groups um, to be all of one class, right? And uh, I need to find a feature that gives us the purest leaves in the tree. Um, so that they're all in the one class. But we can also say that that would be, if it's all in the same class, we can say they have zero entropy. And entropy turns out to be, a, in my opinion, and others, a great way to, break, to differentiate examples in the decision tree. <clears throat> and I'll show you an example of it. Uh, I'll show you an equation for entropy and an example for, with entropy in a moment. So we have to find a um, best feature, and entropy is a good way to do it. Uh, we choose the feature which gives the minimum entropy after we split the data. That means we break it into a couple groups, two, three, however many classes we have. But I'm going to just break it into two groups, keep life simple for, for us. So we continue splitting the data <clears throat> so the leaves are pure, meaning they're all in one class. We can't split anymore, meaning that they're, they're mixed classes. I don't have any more features or any any split I give, any split I use of the data does not give me pure classes. Or I, I have only some number, and I, I agree to accept some noise, some n examples of the smaller class at a leaf. And in general, you want to do this. You want to accept some noise because you can't get it perfect. Um, decision trees are simple as a simple algorithm, <clears throat> but it, it's notoriously sensitive to the training set. What does that mean, <clears throat> notoriously sensitive? One change in examples can mean many changes in tree. So this seems like a really bad thing, right? I mean, you want kind of stability of your, you want to have to learn something, not like somebody gives you one different example and all everything goes different. Um, but people figured out a ways to exploit that. So 
let the cha data change a little bit, get a different tree, take a bunch of trees and vote them, then that will give you both a more stable classifier and actually a quite a bit more accurate classifier. So that's an exploitable feature. All right, an example. Uh, think of two classes I was discussing before, just call them C1 and C2, three features, F1, F2, F3, and 10 examples of numeric values. So here's my data, feature one, feature two, feature three, I just have some numeric values in here. I have classes C1 up here, C2 here, so I have what, five C1s and five C2s, right? And then I can look at using these features to um, test the data. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to take one numeric split of the data. So I say data can be less than or equal to, or sorry, greater than or equal to something or less than something. So I take one number and I find things greater than or equal to it or less than that. I'm not going to tell you how I managed to pick out that number. I have to do some search, but I just want to use this illustrative example. And so kind of the best kind of ones I can do using feature one here is to say if it's greater than or equal to 20 and less than 20, and then it gives me at the leaves, as when I split the data, three C1s, it's two C2s, two C1s, and three C2s. That's not that great a split. If I use F2, I end up with three C1, and, and I come up with greater than or equal to 30 and less than 30. I have three C1s, three C2s, two C1s, and two C2s. And what we would like is to have, a perfect thing would be, so no C1s and three C2s. So it's all one class. That's what we really like, because then we've, really split them apart, we can tell them apart. But we don't have that, so no good. Now for F3, when I go greater than or equal to 50 and less than 50, I end up with four C1s and one C2 here and one C1 and four C2s over here. So this is looking pretty good. I've almost, you know, if I go this way, I almost can say, hey, it's most likely class C2. If I go this way, I can really say, ah, oh, it's most likely class C1. I have one error, but I'm doing much better. And the question is, can I make that this even better? And how and and how would I measure this? You know, so we can look at it and say, ah, yeah, there's 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 a, a pretty good separation because we have we can count. And there's four of one class and one of the others, but we can also use entropy, and that's what is actually used in many decision trees. It's not the only measure, but um, we can set we can do this. And I wanted to show this to you. One equation, my friend. And Ron Yeager always says, show an equation. I always say, well, I don't want to confuse people with too many equations. They can look them up. I'm going to show you one. Um, so let P1, P2 to Pn be the proportion of examples in each class. As proportions can also be called probabilities. So I say, you know, the proportion is 3 out of 5. That's also the probability of 0.6. And what does entropy measure? It measures disorder, and it's from information theory. So Shannon's information theory was looking at the number of bits that you had issues with, and it was initially applied to bits, bits are binary digits. If you never knew what a bit is, now you do. It's a binary digit. Um, or where the word bits came from, I'm sure you know what a bit is. Uh, so if I have n classes, the entropy would be minus p1 log base 2, because we started with bits, log base 2, p1, minus p2, log base 2 of p2, minus, minus, minus pn, log base 2 of pn. You might say, well, why, why do you have a minus all the time? Well, if you think about this, this is a proportion. So p one is going to be um, greater than or equal to zero and less than or equal to one. So what is the log of um, 0.5? It's a negative number. It's, so if I want uh, two, I take two to the minus one, that's equal to 0 0.5. So I'm going to generally get negative numbers. I don't want negative numbers for my entropy, so I put minuses in there. All right. So if all those examples are in um, uh, class one, so P1 represents proportion. All examples are are in P1 as C1. Well, and they're the same. You know, let's say it's class one. Um, we would have one log one, uh, and then everything else is zero log zero. And one log one does um, two to the zero equals one. That becomes a zero. So there's no Disorder, so it's a good split, so it has no disorder. And what you end up using in decision trees is information gain. Where you try to get the most change in the disorder from the root, 
uh, your split. But I'm going to not uh, what what I want to just get the message I want to get through to you is we want the purest leaves now. There's I'm leaving out steps, of course. All right, so now I want to so I could have used that to choose this split, and then I can go in and say, well, what of the features left uh, could I use and to make it better? And I find out F2 will work. If I have less than 38, I end up with four C2s. And if I have greater than or equal to 38, I end up with um, one C1. So these are pure splits. I've got the maximum. Um, I have no entropy there. I have the maximum difference in entropy between um, what I had here, which is four and one, and here. So this is perfect. And now I'm building decision trees. You can see how they're built. This is um, I don't know if you can build them yet, but you can see what's going on. You just do this recursively at each point. So if I had still more disorder here, I could continue to recursively do this. Okay. Now, interesting things about questions, I think, about artificial intelligence. Um, can it ever be better than human performance? Well, yes. Games were a domain where um, people would show that, uh, that humans were better than computers. Um, and chess was, I think, the first one. But there are several AI-assisted systems that seem unbeatable by humans in chess. <clears throat> and there's, I think, at least one AI system that doesn't have um, really any human, doesn't really have any human rules in it. It's a purely learned system. I don't know. It, it, it's probably unbeatable by people. Um, AlphaGo is the best AI player in Go. Checkers AI systems are the best today. When I was a graduate student at Florida State, the world champion uh, check, checkers player was um, at Florida State. Right? was a faculty member. An AI system came along and beat him, and uh, that was the first time he'd been beat in many years. Um, and nobody has beaten that system. No human has beaten it. So how did this happen? How, I mean, how did AI get better? How did we get chess programs that were better than people? Because for a long time, they were the, the people beat them fairly easily. One thing is um, computing power, clever research algorithms, and machine learning. Now we're starting to see, forget the, forget the clever search algorithms. Let's <clears throat> just use computing power and machine learning. One very powerful way of doing learning is what's called reinforcement learning. It's a fairly simple idea. You play against yourself endlessly. The program plays against itself endlessly. And it all that happens is you get a reward when you win. Now, you know, if you think about playing against your friend in a chess match, you get a reward when you win. You win, you feel good, you laugh at your friend, maybe. You commiserate with your friend, maybe whatever you do, but you feel good. Um, but this is not, you know, a reward doesn't tell you why you won. It just tells you you won, and you should feel good about it. You want to get more rewards. And that is what Alpha Zero does, uses that and some search. So we haven't completely given up on search. But there's a system called Giraffe, which you can actually, um, I think, get yourself. Its learning system uses deep learning. Deep neural networks to automatically uh, extract features, and it's going to be doing um, pattern recognition of the board, what's going on. Its trained evaluation function is comparable to the state of the art chess program. So, this one is purely learned, doesn't have any extra search built in. And so, comparable to the evaluation functions of state of the art chess engines uh, with human rules. Remember I said, uh, maybe all we need is powerful computing and um, machine learning. Well, that, this, this is powerful computing and machine learning. And so these engines that, that it's comparable to have thousands of lines of carefully handcrafted pattern recognizers, which are tuned over a lot of years by both computer chess experts and human chess masters. Mm -hmm. Wow. So we have uh, essentially learned the world's best algorithm for chess. Wow. All right. So what drives the current 
the AI buzz? Why do people care about it? Why <clears throat> are so many people studying it? This is my opinion, and some people will disagree. It's okay. But I think there's three big factors. We have large data collections now. Uh, that comes from text and newspapers, things, magazines, et cetera, that are online. You can grab all those digitally. More pictures than you'll ever want to see online. Lots of video online, lots of voice online. <clears throat> we can capture all of that. We can especially capture pictures. So um, AI is really good with images because images that, of regular scenes, it's really good with images of regular scenes because there are lots of those online. You can just grab them. You don't have to have any permission. You can work with those. Um, and then deep neural networks. These are adept at learning from lots of data, so they can learn from lots of data. Lots of data is good for them. And then graphical processing units. Why do we have graphical, graphical, or the graphical processing units? We want to thank computer gamers. I myself don't actually play computer games, <clears throat> but GPUs are set up to quickly render different scenes in computer games. And then people realize that they do really great for um, image processing, because that's what you have. You're, you're creating new images. Um, and they work well for voice, which you can think of as a big data set. They're indispensable for allowing uh, learn models to be built faster. So. Another thing that I imagine you have heard of, maybe you've even seen some um, autonomous vehicles driving around, although from my experience, from my experience in India, I can't, if an autonomous vehicle can drive through Kolkata, then I think it has succeeded in being one heck of an AI. I don't know how anybody drives through Kolkata. I do know how Americans drive through Kolkata. They drive with somebody else driving because they'll just sit there. Um, there are some ethical and technical problems to overcome before we can ditch our steering wheels. And I'll talk a little bit about those. The deep neural networks, <clears throat> which are the buzz, they very, very, very loosely model the human brain. And you have neurons or nodes and links, which are connections. And I'll show you pictures in a moment. So what is new about them? <clears throat> when I was a graduate student, um, neural networks were quite the rage, but they had one hidden layer. So they would they would not have 150 hidden layers. The hidden layers are things that are neither inputs nor outputs. <clears throat> Sorry. And they're called hidden units. Um, and it turns out, <clears throat> My voice is doing funny things, sorry. Turns out, relatively simple backpropagation algorithm can be used to train deep neural networks. So backpropagation um, requires you to multiply, add, and use some functions. You have to be able to understand one partial derivative. You don't have to actually do it. So it's really, I think, easy to comprehend and easy to implement, and it works really, really well. But I'm sure everybody, um, and this, listening to this talk, could in fact build the machinery for a deep neural network because it just requires multiplying, adding, and using some very relatively simple functions. All right. But, uh, and, and back to history, uh, one hidden layer. So the reason that nobody bothered with deep neural networks was uh, there was a nice theorem that said you could arbitrarily closely approximate any function with a single hidden layer. So a single layer that was neither input or output. Arbitrarily close, closely approximate any function. So why bother with more hidden layers? Well, the reason is that the theorem did not tell you a few things about building that universal approximator. It did not tell you how many hidden units you needed. It did not tell you um, what the connections should look like. It did not tell you whether you could actually learn that model. It did not tell you what the um, transfer function should be and, and 
more. So there were a lot of things it didn't tell you, which meant it turns out that we never could figure out how to use one hidden layer to do all the cool things that deep neural networks can do. So deep neural networks, if we can take one big labeled um, data set and learn classifiers or regression models. So I'm going to speak about classes, putting things in classes. You can also do regression, predict numbers. Um, then you can do a lot to build an AI with little human intervention. And the first big success for this, and I'll discuss it a little bit more, was to label images, which conventional approaches were pretty poor at, but people are really good at. So if I start flashing a bunch of images to you of, say, uh, animals, most of you will be able to quickly identify them. If I put exotic animals in there, and then you're going to have a harder time. But if I put, you know, normal animals that you see regularly, if I put cows in there, if I put dogs in there, if I put cats in there, if I put particular kinds of birds that you may see regularly, you're going to have no problems. All right, a neural network. Here, we have the input layer. Here, we have the output layer. These are hidden layers, because they're not hidden input or output. And originally, hidden layers were very scary, because we knew how to change the weights for the output layer to, to improve performance. We knew how to, but and, and on the layer coming in from the input, we didn't know how to change the weights uh, that dealt with these hidden units. It was backpropagation that was developed by various different people enabled that to happen. So more than one hidden layer is, is a deep neural network. So this has three hidden layers. That's so deep neural network. And um, all the links between the inputs and outputs have learnable weights on them. So we have uh, weight, say, zero here, weight one here, weight two. I can arbitrarily put these numbers on there. Over here, we'd have weight let's say, uh, 60. just need to make sure it doesn't collide with anything else. But I don't have to enumerate them all for you. And this is what's called a deep autoencoder. And it seems like a really dumb thing when I tell you what it does. It, essentially, you take the inputs and you um, put back those inputs. These inputs become the outputs. So if, this, if I input 1, 0, 1, 1, then I get as output 1, 0, 1, 1. And you'll say, well, I mean, what's the point of that? Well, the point is I have gone from four values here to three to two, and then I go back upwards. So in here, got some sort of encoding of these four, which may be something I can use in a useful way. Um, and and we're not going to spend any other time on it, but there is a point to, um, to autoencoders. They are useful. Okay. All right. Now, here's a really deep convolutional neural network which can do lots of different kinds of things. And, you know, I cannot, this takes like a couple of lectures to go through and a bunch of lectures to come up to. But so I'm kind of jumping, showing you the deep end of the pool without um, actually showing you how to swim. But um, I'm not going to make you jump in. Okay, so we have inputs here, outputs here, and we have all sorts of stuff in here. Um, what we do is we take a kernel and we run it up over the image and we extract features. The really big thing about convolutional neural networks is that they, remember I said they extract the features for you. So you, you don't have to figure out what the right features are for this particular problem. It'll figure it out for you. So we have some kernel functions in there. Uh, we have the convolution, which is the using the kernel functions. We have things, max pooling, we reduce the size. We do some more uh, kernels to convolutions. We do some more reduce Using size, and then we have what are these are what are um, called fully connected layers. These are what standard are the old non-convolutional networks. This gets pretty deep. This gets pretty complicated. You can do lots of different kinds of things. Where when I say pretty complicated, what I really mean is you can have lots of different combinations of things that we do to the use. So there's lots of parameters in this. So when I used to build neural networks back in the 80s, I'd have maybe no maybe 200 parameters i don't think i ever built one with 200 parameters we'll say this is old uh, one of my students yesterday was talking about something with 
hundred thousand parameters and they said eh, it's a small network. That's a lot of parameters. That's you know three orders of magnitude bigger. Gotta have a lot of data for that. All right, so let's let's take a look at some of the things that can be done. Um this is a really simple I think example. These are what's called the MNIST data and it's uh, images of handwritten characters zero through nine. Why was it interesting? Because on um, their addresses, on uh, letters, and people would like to have those automatically recognized. And in fact, um, today they are, the automatic recognizers today are better than people who recognize the number. So how does this actually work? You just take, in this case, you have 28 by 28 images, so 28 uh, pixels this way, 28 pixels this way, and just use the pixel intensity. So you have 784 features. These are pixel intensities. You have a training set of 60,000 examples of these. So you might say, okay, so we have 10 numbers, so there's 6,000 uh, in each of the classes, and that would make sense. It's not true. It's close. And then a separate test set of uh, 10,000 examples where there's more like 1,000 actually in each class for testing. And then when, when I say, you know, when I was talking about the data not being perfect, no data set is ever perfect. That's, that's one thing you will le learn if you work with uh, machine learning. Your data sets are always imperfect. You never get exactly what you hope. So how did um, MNIST get work? get to be really, how did the results get to be really good? People did elastic distortion, so you, you change the um, data by ch um, stretching it a little bit to get possible images that are realistic. The large deep convolutional network elastic distortions had 0.35% error on test data versus 0.95% for no distortions, so distortions dropped off six tenths of a percent. An ensemble of 35 convolutional networks using um, elastic distortion. So these guys uh, voted. Whoops, W not it. Voted. Had 0.23% error, so even less than the 0.35. The human error rate is about is a little bit over 1%. So people mess it up at about 1%. The system messes it up about 0.23%. Um, in the U.S. postal system, I don't believe people look at numbers uh, for addresses anymore. They're not as good. All right, so this is one of my uh, favorite little pictures. <clears throat> These are images from the ImageNet competition. A large set of images were gathered <clears throat> to be recognized just off of the, the Internet, so just, you know, random images that you could pick, but of actual scenes. So you might say, well, how come I'm showing you these? What are these things? And why am I showing you these? And what the heck does this guy have? All right. So these are um, some pictures of hammers and bowls. And we were looking for, uh, we did some work on ImageNet. There's 10 million or 14 million, depending on the version that you're looking at, examples in there. And we wanted to know how many were misclassified. So they've been classified by luckless graduate students who had to do it or uh, Mechanical Turk, or maybe faculty did some, but sometimes people get it wrong. This is a hammer. I don't know what it is. This is not, not a hammer for sure. Not a hammer. No hammers here. Um, this is also a hammer. Nope. Bowl. Bowl. So we built an automatic misclass a system that automatically found, I, I forgot to tell the full story, that automatically finds uh, misclassifications in ImageNet. Now, the good news is, is there really aren't very many, so I'm showing you a bunch of them. The error rate that the people that um, built ImageNet speculated uh, was higher than the what we found with our system. So, and we we um, actually picked classes of things that we thought would be difficult to differentiate. Like, I'm not showing it, but like alligators and crocodiles, which are not that easy to differentiate for humans. Um, and, and so image, the, the labels in ImageNet are really good. There's a, some noise, but it turns out some label noise is okay. That's a different story. Um, anyway, so bowl, bowl, um, bowl, bowl, 
bowl, so this is not a bowl, it's a cooking thing. Now these are kind of interesting, they're called bowls, they in fact are bread bowls, but they're odd bowls because, you know, when I've had a bread bowl and I'm really hungry after something in a cold day, I eat the bread bowl, I eat the bowl, so I don't know, it's a different kind of bowl. Anyway, those are some of the images. I want to tell you a little about the ImageNet um, contest because it's really where everybody suddenly woke up and said, my goodness, these deep neural networks are really good, really important. Um, and uh, we realized that they could be very dominant. So it's actually called the, the people talk about ImageNet, but it actually was the large scale visual recognition challenge. It was done yearly, a thousand categories of RGB images. So these are camera images at red, green, blue channels. Training data was 10 million labeled images depicting 10,000 plus object categories. It's so not an easy problem. A lot of categories, a lot of examples. For 2017, the test data was 150,000 photographs collected from Flickr and other search engines, and they were hand labeled with the presence or absence of 1,000 objects. So just think about the uh, logistics of this. So 2017, we had to get 150,000 photographs labeled. That's a lot of labeling, right? And the validation data was a random 50,000 taken out of the 150,000 examples. So you had to classify, you had to classify 100,000 examples. So why was this all very important? Well. 2012, you saw the top five error. So whether you got something in the top five, go to 15.3. Why is that a big deal? People have been stuck around 25% for a few years, number of years, actually. So the people were going from 25.9% and they win next year 25.8%. The next year they win 25.75%. Next year they win 25.5%. And I'm exaggerating a bit if you know the image, net, the challenge. You probably say, hey, wait a minute, it wasn't like that. It was like 30% and on that. Okay, I know. But I want to try to make a point. So it stuck around 25%. All of a sudden in 2012 with a deep neural network, it dropped about 10%. The accuracy dropped, the error rate dropped 10%. That just is, if you've done machine learning data mining, you know that getting a 10% change in performances just doesn't happen very often. And if you get it, you're extremely happy. So everybody said, oh my goodness, we best pay attention to this. Well, then in, by 2014, with 19 layers, it had eight layers. This had 19. It was it dropped. It half, got halved to 7.3%. 2016, so it had AlexNet, then VGGNet. <clears throat> ResNet came along in 2016, had 152 layers. Error was 3.6%, dropped by two. 2017, when the contest finally ended, because, I mean, 2.25% better than people. People do. 152 layers, same numbers, so squeeze and excitation, ResNet, so they did a little something to mess with ResNet. Didn't quite have it, but down to 2.25% top five error. And things have improved with the top error since then using deep neural networks. But we went from one hidden layer to 152. Um, so driverless car kinds of things. They use camera images. LiDAR images, for example, and the models can be learned to recognize signs, follow the road edges, follow the markings on the road, recognize signals, pedestrians, bicycles, all sorts of things. But there are interesting questions for an uh, artificial intelligence system. What do you do? You come around a blind corner with a cliff from the passenger side and two children in the road, in the car's lane, another car oncoming, and you cannot avoid hitting at 20 miles miles an hour, the, the um, people, do you go off the cliff? Do you go head on into the other car and perhaps kill both you and the other person? Do you hit the people? What does the AI do? Do you have a dial in your car that says you want to be more altruistic and less altruistic? Uh, there are no good answers to that. Okay. So this, I'm going to, uh, well, this isn't going to work as um, perfectly because it's not, I'm showing you in PDF, but this picture below, I think all of you would look at and say, ah, oh, that's a stop sign. Some people put um, some stickers on it. 
you can read stop, you know it. But deep neural networks trained in autonomous cars call the above thing a 45 mile an hour speed limit sign. That's going to be a problem if you've got an autonomous car and it sees a stop sign and um, thinks it's a 45 mile an hour speed limit sign. Uh, in my sister in law's neighborhood, they have something that has a sticker that says, please, on top of stop. Now, I was wondering if that was a, um, how that would be interpreted. I never was able, unfortunately, to get people to look at that for me because I felt, felt like it was a bit frivolous. But anyway, um, the deep learning for COVID-19 from chest x-ray stuff that, that we've done, and uh, I, I believe Sushmita has done, Dr. Mitra has done, um, and people have built really accurate classifiers to models to differentiate COVID-19 from pneumonia using chest x-rays, chest x -rays, diagnose it with accuracy over 95%. Um, there's chest x-ray machines almost everywhere. One thing that we've noticed is that um, none of the known models, and we noticed the hard way, have been shown to work really well on unseen sources. They seem to learn something about sources and processing for the x-rays of COVID and the x-rays of um, non-COVID uh, or pneumonia. And that's a bit of a problem for AI in general. So what did you learn? So deep learning can learn unexpected stuff. So again, I should, I really should switch to the PowerPoint, but I haven't, so I'm not going to here. But you see a given over here, sorry, a panda over here. But, uh, the deep neural network calls it a given. The, this guy is called a given in this image. If you look at the image, you stare at it hard on your screen, and it's a little hard, hard because the resolution on our screens, and even on my screen, which is fairly high resolution, isn't the greatest that you would like. But, but you can't really see a difference. And and here's a real gibbon. And the real gibbon is a monkey. Does it look like a panda? I mean, if you sort of flat the panda's face, maybe. But I bet you that none of you would agree if I didn't label these things and you didn't know oh, the difference didn't know pandas and didn't know gibbons, none of you would agree that this, these two are the same things. So how did that happen? It happened because we added noise. So this image and this image are different because of the noise. That's why I said look really hard. If you look, look really hard, you might see some of the differences because of this noise. The noise is quite a bit of red, green, blue in there, and it just changes it enough that the AI system gets confused. Confused. And that's a little bit scary because I don't think any people are going to be confused. And if I want to spoof something, I can do it. And pro probably some of you have seen people spoofing uh, with deep fake videos, which is a different story. Okay. So how about I said I showed you some pitfalls. Let's let's talk about some good things um, that that have worked well. Path.ai. This is a commercial product. Um, it's just almost FDA approved, I think, but it's being behind, used behind the scenes in clinical trials. It, it, so this is in pathology. It not only finds cancer cells, but rates the advancement of tumors and suggests lines of attack for therapy. So that tells the physician, hey, you might try this and this and this. Now, some some pathologists and for the, you know oncologists know everything there is to know. That research is well, they know everything about what their research institution is is done in, is in the literature. But this also could suggest things that are even broader. Um, so it counts immune cells surrounding a tumor and tries to figure out the properties that make them useful for the latest immunotherapies. Um, these are treatments that amp up the body's natural defenses to fight cancers. Immunotherapies are very interesting in that they can completely eradicate a cancer. They can uh, really inflame the situation and make you much sicker. And unfortunately, they can result in death. And you really don't want to use immunotherapy therapy unless it's going to help, and and this is one thing that hopes to do that. Another interesting positive study, and there are many positive studies, I, I wanted to show some pitfalls so you don't all walk out and say, well, I should just work on AI because it is the solution to everything. It isn't. <laughs> Porteous is a chatbot that can literally save lives. Problem is emergent dispatchers, this is in uh, the UK, United Kingdom. 
and then get calls about cardiac arrest. But they have to figure out the problem because the caller is stressed. You know, they're having trouble breathing. They can't walk, whatever. They're super tired, whatever it may be. And Cordy learned to recognize calls of cardiac arrest from 161,000 calls, of which 2,000 were cardiac arrest. So this is pretty good because it's a very unbalanced data set, and it, and it did that pretty well. And so how good is it? Cordy was right 93% of the time. People are right 73% of the time. So it's 20% right, 20% more correct than people. And it came to the answer 30 seconds before people did on average. So not only was it correct, but it would, and time matters for cardiac events. So when it detects a cardiac arrest, it notifies the dispatcher who tells the people on site to do CPR and it calls for an ambulance automatically. And it can also check addresses in the background. So this can be a really big help. So some of my own work, my group's work, no. um, predicting lung cancer in the future. So people that smoke a lot tend to have uh, lung nodules, many of them, will have lung nodules. Most nodule, lung nodules are um, benign, and actually the chance of a smoker getting lung cancer is something like 15%. A heavy smoker getting lung cancer is 15%. Now, don't take that to mean that you can get away with smoking because you are light, unlikely to get lung cancer because smoking causes other kinds of cancers too. But I'm just talking about lung cancer, and, and it's generally bad for you. Um, so a traditional uh, feature extraction model on Radiomics was uh, coined not so long ago. I hate calling it traditional, but we're moving fast these days, um, which we extract features, of, and, and we're going to look at transfer learning and three convolutional models to build an ensemble and um, predict lung cancer in the future from CT screens. There's an interesting paper by uh, Google that also does this. I, um, Google doesn't do it as far in the future as we do and doesn't have quite as good a results as um, uh, this. So if you've seen the Google paper and say, why are we doing it? I just wanted to mention that. All right. So this is from the uh, U.S. National Lung Cancer Screening Trial. The screening trial was to determine whether uh, computed, computed tomography was better than x-rays. It stopped after three years for, for screening. It was stopped after three years because com computed, computed tomography, CT, was so much better than x-rays. Boom. Came over. Uh, so we have two cohorts. Um, and we have a positive screen at T0, no cancer, positive screen at T1, cancer, no cancer, cohort 2, positive screen at T0, meaning we find a nodule, we still see the nodule T1, we still see the nodule T2, but some of them are non-cancer and some of them are uh, cancers. And these T times are over years, one year, two years, approximately, because if you obviously are having some problems, you come in earlier. Now, you might look at this and say, okay, so you chose, how come you chose 85, 85? 176 and 152. Well, that's a really good question. You might think, well, you must have gone for 85 to make it even in both. Nope. What we did is we found all <clears throat> all examples that were malignant. They were, I think, at time zero, something like 105, and at time two uh, for cohort two, there was something like 115. But then we have to follow the nodule over time. And um, there was disagreements over being able to, uh, over what nodule it was. Uh, there would be missing um, images, and there would be blurred images, various different problems. And it just ended up that we got 85 usable cases. It's just coincidence that it's 85. Same thing for the nodule positive controls. Um, we took as many as we could, and we ended up with what we could use. This is typical medical imaging. All right, so the radiomics features. We had 219 radiomics features that include size, texture, grade level, co-occurrence matrices, and um, 23 rider stable features were chosen from 219 radiomics features. Um, and it was stable across two scans. So there was a test done that where they scanned the person twice uh, it had some nodules and we utilized that to see if their features were stable <clears throat> we used features like their symmetric uncertainty random forest classifier we were able to get at the time the best accuracy we could get was 76.79 percent a area under the curve of 
1.81, we had 10 features. Transfer learning, take a con uh, convolutional network pre-trained in this case on ImageNet. <clears throat> so it's learned things about, um, presumably it's learned things about um, edges and um, texture. And we took some stuff from the last convolution layer. We used a 2D approach. So all the features before in this previous slide were 3D. So these are 3D features. Now we move to 2D. And um, I see I'm coming up on an hour. I think I have a little bit more time. Is that correct? Or should I be finishing uh, up? Yes, sure, you can. Please continue. OK. I, I'm getting close to finish. Okay, um, so uh, so convolutional network pre-trained on ImageNet. We took out the features from the last fully connected layer. We had a 2D approach. Uh, we chose the slice with the uh, largest nodule for each patient case, so the, the slice with the largest nodule in it. And the nodule region was gotten by putting a rectangular box around the nodule that, uh, that completely fit the nodule. So here, over here is a nodule. There's a red box around it. Here we have uh, shown how it looks close up. Um, and, and, uh, and, and this is long, I should say, that uh, this is in the right long, and you're going, huh? That looks like the left to me, but you're looking this way, so it's right long. Um, and we had physicians involved in this, so it was not me doing the uh, extraction of uh, nodules, which is good, because you really don't want, want me to do it. We use VGGS, so you heard about VGT before. Uh, trained with pre-trained with CNN, we actually were doing this before some of the ResNet came out. Um, we used uh, all color channels, so the pre-trained CNN. So we we duplicated the image three times, um, and we used some feature selectors, and we got accuracy not not that great with 15 features um, in the training and sort of learning, but it was close. And what's interesting here is while it's only 75 percent, we didn't have to extract any features. As you can imagine, we spent a long time figuring out what should be the 219 features and extracting them were just a little, little bit worse, so we didn't do any feature extraction. The network did it for us. So now we build our own convolutional neural networks. And um, we did a uh, bit of rotation and flipping to generate some artificial data. <clears throat> Our input size was 100 by 100. Our learning rate was small, 0.0001, which means when we had a change to the weights, we didn't do much of the change that was recommended. We used some augmented data in training, some in validation, um, and cohort two was used to train. So we had to test the best validated model. So we had separate test data, the data from two years ago. So we used three CNN architectures, and each one was um, okay. Seventy, the AUCs, the area under the curves were better, and in fact, for the third one, the accuracy was almost exactly the same as our carefully handcrafted system, and the AUC was considerably better. But then, still not all that great. But then we said, well, can we break this into? Can we use all these and vote? And we can. And so we created ensemble co uh, combinations. We combined all these. We had either vote. We'd say, if you say cancer and the other one says no cancer, that's one for, one against. Or we just said, what is the average probability of cancer added up? And if it's the maximum versus no cancer, use that, or we use the median probability. But um, I think we, we got the best results with average. We had three subsets of classifiers that were created for different ensembles. So three CNN architectures, best CNN model, radiomics, and transfer learning models, and all of the models. How good was it? Okay, so this is subset three. I'm only going to tell you about that. All the models, our average accuracy when we voted everything was 89%, almost 90%. Now you might say, how does this compare to physicians? You don't compare it to physicians right now because they do not try to com they do not try to look at a nodule and say whether they believe it will be cancer in two years. Um, they will look at a nodule and decide whether it's cancer or not. Of course, they will look at a nodule and decide whether it should be person should be rescanned, of course, but they don't try to make this kind of prediction. But um, we compared with our original results, we were quite significantly better. The AUC is 0.96, so you, if you're willing to accept more false positives, you can get even more of the ones that are going to be problematic. Um, so we were pretty happy. So this was the average uh, 
had the highest AUC. The um, accuracy is slightly higher with voting, but the AUC was slightly different. And of course, combination approaches are designed to give you best accuracy, not best AUC, which you wouldn't necessarily know. One other case study to finish off with somebody else's stuff, that I think this is a really interesting one. You wanted to detect diabetic retinopathy, uh, so the leading cause of blindness. There are lots of images, 120,000 retinal fundus photographs. That's a lot. They're used to train a deep neural network. Um, the diagnosis is by direct visualization um, by medical specialists through an eye exam or imaging, and then you grade the level of disease and the presence of lesions that are characteristic, uh, blood vessel damage, like hemorrhages, microaneurysms, et cetera. And um, you can get, in the world, there's just not enough specialists to do this, especially in some places. But the, the deep neural network is just about as good as specialists. So if you go to a place where you don't and have specialists, or, and this would be true in regions within the United States also, you can't, you'd have to go hundreds of miles to get to a specialist. You can use this system. You can just have an automated system look at your eyes with some dilation, which a local doctor can put in, and tell you whether you have this problem. So that's, I think, a big win. Um, all right, just about to finish up. On the singularity, uh, will we, sometimes people ask me this question, so I wanted to just, I think it's an interesting question to bring it up. Will we be building AI um, that through learning and knowledge built in, you know, common sense knowledge, et cetera, don't stand in front of a moving, fast moving object? It's a good one. You know, somebody throws a ball fast, don't be there, don't go in front of a car, don't go in front of a bike, don't go in front of a train, uh, don't go in front of a fast running person because all of those are going to have bad outcomes, um, some very, very bad outcomes. And uh, you know, I had a short discussion with a well known philosopher and, and, and short discussions with philosophers are, can be rare because they can go on. And I don't know if all many of you know, some of you might be philosophers, you may know, philosophers tend to be very mathematical. I mean, if you know about Cartesian coordinates, that comes from Descartes, who was a philosopher. Uh, and there's lots of other things that they do, second order logics. Now, um, I, I was expecting this particular person who has some very strong views to say there's no way that you will ever have a conscious AI. He was not willing to say it could not happen. He didn't say it could happen. He didn't say he thought it would happen. He simply was not willing to say no way, which surprised me. Um, if consciousness is achieved, will it be able to outthink us? Will it be superior? So the AI I, I would probably be a robot with vision, hearing, touch, emotion, which are all current areas of research, and you know, maybe it'll be superior. I don't know. Uh, when would a singularity happen? I think with convention, so this is, of course, my opinion, and you know, others listening to this talk may have very different opinions, but with conventional computing, I don't think in the foreseeable future. With quantum computing, I really don't know, but that could change the game. We don't have good quantum computing, so not an issue at the moment. So wanted to summarize this. Um, AI is largely being driven by machine learning today, but it's being used today. And there are parts of AI I have not touched on, uh, symbolic processing, symbolic systems. Um, uh, we can aspire to be the best human in chess or Go player and be the top chess or Go player in the world, but we probably are not going to be the best one in the world because there are going to be computers that beat us, computer systems that beat us. The deep learning craze is going to result in products. Uh, there are going to be missteps. I fear uh, some of those are going to be with cars. Um, if we can combine learning with common sense world knowledge, that seems a, prom a promising way forward. There are things that we quickly learn in one shot, like you have, like my grand daughter will learn, you know, if she touches something hot, that that hurts. And so when we tell her something's hot, she doesn't touch it. Or if she has a hot drink, she blows on it. We don't have to tell her this, you know, to learn that a drink is hot or that a plate is hot or that the ground is hot. It just She has the concept of hot. AI doesn't have this concept that can apply widely. Uh, similarity seems uh, murky in the future if it, it happens at all. And uh, questions? Uh, yeah. Thank you, Professor Paul, for the wonderful presentation. Uh, we, would love, we would love to invite you questions from the participants. Participants, you can unmute yourself and you can ask questions.
Please don't be shy. Ask. I'd be happy to answer your questions. Uh, I would request all the participants to switch on your video so that we can take some uh, photographs. So is there no question from anybody? So I had one question. Uh, okay. On, on, on one of your slides, I think it was uh, uh, slide 22. Uh, so there was this stop sign and you said that uh, it made a mistake. It, in uh, uh, thinking it was 45 miles per hour. So why do you think uh, was the mistake? I mean, like in the Gibbon case, you said that the uh, noise was there. So uh, uh, in this case, what could be one of the reasons that it recognized it as 45? Uh, that, that's a really good question because what it means is that the deep learning network didn't learn the shape of the sign because the shapes of the signs are very different, right? One is rectangular and one has got it more sides. Uh, so it has learned something other than that. And I think that it's likely when you put those stickers on there, it's thinking that there's a number there because it sees some of the lines there and they connect to the stickers. So it's deciding that that makes a number. And somehow it has decided that those letters on a stop sign don't matter, but numbers on a speed limit sign do matter. And this is actually the big problem, Sushmita. Yes, yes. What have these suckers learned? We don't know. Right. I like yes. I can ask you, yes. what do you use to stop at a stop sign? You say, well, I like a red. I know it's red and I know it has, you know, I don't worry about those letters, but you could tell me. Right. But I, we, we can't query. I mean, I know you know this, but for everybody else, it, it, querying the system is really hard to do. Yes, that's true. Yes. <laughs> so anybody else? Yeah, there is a chat message. Yeah, I saw that. Let me see if I can see the chat. You think there's a point in time the further development AI would require the help of another AI because at that point it would have surpassed human cognitive capacity. That is an interesting question. Uh, that is an inter interesting question. So it needs help from another AI. People are useless now. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> well, AI, I think then, it, so I guess I would say no. If an AI is that advanced, it can learn on its own, right? It'll develop its own ability to, you know, won't have to do deep learning kinds of things. It'll build its own automatic deep learning somehow. Interesting question. Anything else? Any, any other question? Uh, yeah, uh, uh, there's a small question that I have. Uh, so, so the question that I really had was uh, there's another area that is developing quite uh, well in terms of uh, IoT and uh, its related areas, right? So, so how do you really see the development of AI on embedded platforms? Embedded AI platforms. Um, that's an interesting question. Well, I think that, you know, there are going to be embedded AI kinds of platforms. For example, I would think drones or are an example. You could really have an AI in a drone to do, for example, uh, mapping of uh, power lines and have that embedded in there after you have, have built it and have, you know, you probably don't want to learn on the fly and that takes a lot, a lot of power, but actually just reasoning doesn't take a lot of power. So I think there are going to be some, and I think there probably already are some embedded AI kinds of, you know, items. And you could also have it, for example, in your refrigerator. So if you're willing to flip the switch, it'll reason about when you need to order stuff and it could order automatically online for you. I, I think that could be, you know, problematic if it decides you need a big chunk of ice cream one day and you don't. Yes, Thank you. Thank one you. question from my side. Thank you, sir, for your wonderful program. Hello. Yes, we can yeah. hear you. Yeah, uh, sir, I want to know some feature selection method like neighborhood component analysis. Uh, we select the features uh, on based of weights. So, say components analysis and yeah. selecting feature. I did not quite understand the question. Uh, I want to know some feature selection methods uh, like uh, oh, feature selection methods. Analysis. Yeah, you, you uh, want to know about feature selection methods? Is that what the question is? 
Yes, he wants to yeah, okay. sele- yeah, teacher selection. Okay, okay. Teacher selection methods like neighborhood component analysis, who select the features based on weights. So there are different kinds of approaches to do feature selection, but and well, there are lots of different kinds, but most of them look at how well the feature values correlate with a class and then they how different they are for a different class. So you'd like ideally you'd like a feature that always appears with a particular value for one class and for every other class it has a different value, right? Um, so this is one, I guess, overarching way, and then there are a lot of different mathematical me- methods to decide how how good that you know how, how good that feature is. Yeah, on based on based of weights, can you suggest me some suggest some like methods? I like I like release f as a very simple one, but there's there are also Good. So, the um, using symmetric un- symmetric uncertainty is, is a good one. Um, minimum what MR? I'm MR, forgetting MR, what it is. So, M- MR, huh? MR. MR. Yeah, MR. but what does it? St- I know, but what does it stand for, Sushmita? That's what I'm forgetting. <laughs> minimum <laughs> something <laughs> maximum <laughs> relevance. Maximum. Yeah. Right. Minimum. Yeah, minimum redundancy, maximum relevance. Yes, I think okay. that's right. Um, so MRMR uh, is a very good one. It's a bit more complicated, uh, but it's a very good one. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, is there any more question? Hello. Uh, actually, I, I had one question. Yes. Yeah, so, yeah actually, uh, I actually, I'm sorry, I actually missed 10 minutes of the presentation. Uh, there was some bad uh, uh, internet problem on my side. Uh, I don't know if Sir talked about uh, ne- uh, uh, the neural networks that are not feed forward. So they have some kind of a loop. Uh, did Sir talk um, about that? You mean, you mean uh, recurrent neural networks? No, I did not talk about recurrent neural networks. Oh, okay, okay. Then perhaps my question would be a little uh, irrelevant then. Yeah, sorry. I mean, you know, we do a lot of stuff with recurrent neural networks because we do some predictions in um, in what's going to happen on social networks. Uh, but I didn't talk about that. Okay, thank you, participants. Now I request Chair IDP Golkar Section Professor Sushmita Mitra to present the memento to Professor uh, Hall as a token of appreciation on behalf of appreciation. So, uh, we have prepared a token of Professor Hall. Uh, so, can you display? Yeah. So, this is a green yep, I do see token. It. Uh-huh. <laughs> can, you, can you put it in large uh, phone? Yeah. So, we, uh, we will be planned. So, they have already planted a grove of trees in the uh, mangrove forest, the World Heritage Site, uh-huh. the largest mangrove forest. I hope you like it. Uh-huh. Ah, that's awesome. Yeah, so, so you that's, the certificate that's great. by mail. Oh, great. <laughs> that's very nice. I'm, since, as you know, I really uh, appreciate the environment, so that's a great thing. Thank you. <laughs> You're welcome. It's a great honor and pleasure to be able to honor you with this. And this is all possible because Thank of you. the pandemic. I, Otherwise, this idea wouldn't have originated. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I appreciate Thanks. the opportunity to talk to you all. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you. So, hmm. uh, so uh, uh, with that, I, uh, I thank you for uh, having spent so much time with this wonderful talk. And I thank the participants for uh, having participated participated and uh, brought up questions. I hope you liked it. And if you have any further uh, queries, you're free to send emails to Sir, and uh, and uh, you you can uh, clear your doubts when he has time. So with that, I thank you, Larry, for being with us. So have a very good day. <laughs> okay, and have a good evening to the to rest of you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you.
บายบายบาย So we can uh, leave the meeting now. So thank you for being here. Atonu, please send the certificate. Thanks, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Yeah. Thank you.